Thank you for joining us tonight for the Nuremberg uh, Prize for Science in the Public Interest. This is one of my favorite events during the year because it's a chance for us to bring really the best and brightest from the science community. So it's really a pleasure to welcome you to this event. This event is made possible every year by the generosity of the Nuremberg family. The prize was uh, established by the Nurembergs in honor of, uh, of Bill Nuremberg, who was a former director of, of Scripps. He was the longest serving director of Scripps Oceanography. And our, my thanks, as well as those of the entire Scripps community, go out to the Nuremberg family. Thank you again for making this possible, and you bring us so much scientific delight uh, every year. It's really a pleasure. So it's now my pleasure to uh, welcome to the podium Dr. Walter Schinkel, uh, Bill's son-in-law. And Walter is the Robert O. Lawton Professor at Florida State University, which is that university's highest level of distinction for the prof professoriate. So with that, let me turn to a few remarks on Dr. Doudna. She is the uh, Chancellor's Professor in Biomedicine and Health at the University of California in Berkeley, where she continues and extends her work on several RNA-related systems. Her contributions have been recognized by many awards, including as a young researcher, the Waterman Award, and uh, the Breakthrough Prize in Life Sciences, the Gruber Prize in Genetics, the Canada Gardner International Award, and the Japan Prize. Dr. Doudna was chosen as the 2019 recipient for the Nuremberg Prize for what are among some of the most important advances in the history of molecular genetics, discoveries that, as you will hear, promised to revolutionize our understanding of and control of how genes work. When Dr. Doudna and Emmanuel Charpentier, is that correct, uh, showed in 2012 that enzymes from bacteria that control microbial immunity could be used for precisely editing genomes, you can see that it was kind of a final step for not only describing and understanding genes, genes but also for altering them in specific ways. This makes it one of the most significant discoveries in the history of biology and was completely unimaginable when I was born in 1940. But that's the nature of science, this grand enterprise that we call science. It has been said, and notice I used the passive voice, it has been said that 90% of existing scientific knowledge was created during the life of every scientist that has lived in the last 400 years. That has certainly been my experience when Professor Doudna retires, and whenever she's going to retire, she can be satisfied that she has contributed a substantial amount to that 90%. So from her Wiki Wikipedia page, who doesn't use Wikipedia after all? <laughs> I learned that during her soph sophomore year, she questioned her own ability to pursue a career in science and considered switching her major to French. Hmm. However, her French teacher suggested that she stick with science. <laughs> so, we owe that French teacher a large debt of gratitude because there is no Nuremberg Prize for French in the public interest. <laughs> It's thus my honor, on behalf of the Nuremberg family, Scripps Institution of Oceanography, the University of California, to present this medal for the Nuremberg Prize for Science in the Public Interest to you. It's a real pleasure for me to be here at, uh, at Scripps and to, um, to be able to share with you in this uh, kind of celebration of science. 
I want to start by thanking the Nuremberg family. It's been a real pleasure to meet all of you this evening, and um, also the, the prize uh, selection committee. It's a delight to have this opportunity to share with you science that I've been working on over uh, you know, the last uh, maybe dozen years or so, and to tell you a story that I think really nicely um, illustrates the, the value of fundamental science and curiosity-driven research, something that I've always valued deeply. And for all the students here, uh, I really want to communicate to you that I started off, you know, in sort of very humble beginnings. I grew up in a small town on the island of Hawaii, and nobody in my family was a scientist. I just, you know, I loved chemistry, and uh, I loved uh, mathematics, and I, I kind of thought I wanted to do something in science. Uh, I, I didn't know any scientists, and I certainly didn't know any female scientists. So it seemed like kind of an adventure that I was embarking on. And I was very lucky that I had, along the way, a lot of people who were able to kind of steer me in the right direction at the right time, including my French teacher. So <laughs> thanks for giving her a shout out. Um, and, and what I thought I would do tonight is I really want to do two things. I, I, I want to just share with you a little bit about how we got interested in this area of science and, and to show you that my career started off in a very different place from where, where I am now, where I am today. And that's something I love about science. It goes in directions that I think none of us can really predict. And the other thing I want to share with you, as this is a, uh, a prize about science and the public interest, is to discuss what happened, sort of my personal experience, with being involved in a field that very quickly, sort of before any of us kind of could almost get our heads around it, was going in directions that we realized were going to have profound impacts in the future for everyone. And having to grapple with that and, and think about where we're going with this technology, where we as a, as, a, you know, as a species are really going with a very powerful tool that allows us to alter the DNA sequences in cells and organisms, including in ourselves, and really control ultimately evolution in that way. It's really a, a profound thing to think about. But where did this all begin? And so I thought I would just start by pointing out that you know, when I was growing up, my dad, and my dad was a professor of literature at the University of Hawaii, so he read a lot of books. And uh, he wasn't a scientist, but he liked uh, science books. And one day I came home from school and I saw this sitting in my room. And uh, so this was really one of the first books that I read about science. And if you've read Jim Watson's book, The Double Helix, you know that it's a story of the discovery of the structure of DNA. But it's also a story about the very human aspects of doing science. And I still remember being incredibly surprised to read this book. And you know, I was used to reading you know, kind of dry textbook descriptions of science. And this book, for the first time, kind of made it seem like a very human endeavor with you know, people's foibles and, and uh, you know, just sort of the process of discovery being described in a way that I hadn't been able to imagine before. So this really uh, sort of captivated me. And I would say, in no small way, contributed to my interest in applying the study of chemistry to biological systems. So now, fast forward many years, and you know, I went off to college and majored in chemistry, and then I went to graduate school in biological chemistry. And eventually, uh, you know, through a somewhat circuitous route, I ended up at the University of California, Berkeley, where I started uh, studying the process by which cells are able to control genetic information in cells. And one day in the mid-2000s, I think I'd been at Berkeley about three years, I got a call from uh, Jillian Banfield, a colleague of ours, who told me about a system called CRISPR that at the time almost nobody on the planet had heard about. So it was a very, very obscure area of study. And um, she was extremely excited about it because her work, which was focused on sequencing bacterial DNA, hinted that this CRISPR system might be an adaptive immune system in microbes, in bacteria, a way that bacteria could acquire immunity to viruses that they encountered in the environment. Well, I was, I was intrigued. And I thought this sounded like something very interesting for somebody like me, a biochemist, to investigate. 
Now, part of the reason for that is that um, I have to tell you a little, for those of you that are not, maybe not uh, scientists in the audience or not, not uh, molecular biologists, I have to just remind you that in sort of the fundamental, what we call the central dogma in molecular biology is shown right here, which is that you know, there's sort of this flow of genetic information that controls all of life, namely that genetic information is encoded in DNA and what that code does is to tell cells how to make ultimately proteins, which are on the far right-hand side. And in the middle was this, you know, is this sort of, um, at least when I was taught this originally in college, kind of this very boring uh, molecule called RNA, that you know, kind of, uh, you know, DNA's chemical cousin. And um, you know, we were kind of taught in college that you know this was just kind of a, a transfer molecule. It's just sort of shuffling information from DNA to proteins, and you know, don't pay very much attention to it. And then uh, when I, the wonderful thing about you know going off to graduate school was that I uh, was sort of awakened to the idea that in fact, in in many cases, RNA molecules, these chemical copies of DNA sequences, actually did very interesting things in cells. And so I actually, my whole career from that point on was really focused around understanding the functions of these RNA molecules, what they do, and how they fold up into interesting three-dimensional shapes that allow them to do things in, in cells that can't really be done by either DNA molecules or proteins. Well, so it turns out that in a very interesting way, that interest in understanding RNA and its function in biology converged with CRISPR. And to understand that, I have to show you a little cartoon that illustrates uh, how these adaptive immune systems function in bacteria. And by the way, this is based on not my research, but on work that was done in about five or six laboratories around the world that in the early 2000s were starting to investigate these CRISPR systems to figure out if they really were functioning to protect bacteria from viruses. And so what these uh, handful of scientists figured out is that bacteria, so we're looking here at a cartoon of a bacterial cell that's being infected by a virus. And when a virus infects a cell, whether it's infecting a bacterial cell or, or us, a human cell, what happens is that the virus injects its genetic material, shown here sort of wrapped up in this capsid, injects it into the cell where it then creates a program, a molecular program, that starts to make all the molecules required to make more viruses and kill the cell. That's really the process of viral infection. And so in bacteria, if there's a CRISPR system that's encoded in the DNA of this bacteria, then the cell is able to detect that foreign DNA that gets injected by the virus and insert a little piece of it into this part of the genome known as the CRISPR locus. And this provides a molecular memory of infection that over time grows larger and larger, so it keeps a, a kind of a molecular recording of infections and allows the cell to protect itself. And the way that that protection works involves RNA. So the cell is able to make an RNA copy of this CRISPR sequence, and that RNA is chopped up into units that each include a little squiggly line here that represents a sequence of, uh, coming from a virus. And that sequence is actually a series of letters. It's about 20 letters long, chemical letters, that match letters in the DNA of the virus. And so these RNA molecules combine with proteins encoded by genes sitting next door to the CRISPR locus in the bacterial DNA. And these protein RNA assemblies are able to search through the cell looking for matching DNA sequences. And if those are found, then the cell is able to cut these up and, um, and destroy them. So it's a great way that cells can acquire immunity to phage using this RNA-guided uh, system. So I was very intrigued by this as an RNA biochemist, and I really wanted to understand the process of how this works. Now, just to give you a, a sort of another illustration of, of the way that bacteria are using CRISPR systems, I wanted to show you this uh, video that illustrates how we imagine that uh, CRISPR is operating in, the, in nature. So here's a bacterial cell that's being infected by a virus injecting its DNA. And if the cell has a CRISPR sequence in the genome, it can acquire a piece of viral DNA into this part of its own DNA. 
And um, these are uh, flanked by repetitive sequences, so it kind of signals to the cell that this is a special part of the genome. And when the cell makes an RNA copy of that sequence, those uh, molecules, those CRISPR RNAs, can be chopped into units that each include a sequence that comes from a different virus. These RNAs turn out to combine with a second type of RNA called tracer to form a structure that can interact with a protein known as Cas9. Now that Cas9 protein is able to search the cell looking for molecules of DNA that have a sequence matching this CRISPR RNA sequence. And when that match occurs, the DNA opens up, the Cas9 protein cuts the double helix of DNA, and then these cut up pieces of DNA are degraded. So that's really how this works in nature. And this, uh, this again just shows a cartoon of the pathway. And, um, and, and so at the top, we're looking at a virus injecting its DNA. Here's the CRISPR sequence that's getting expanded as a piece of viral DNA gets inserted into the, the genome. And then here are those RNA molecules generated and combining with Cas proteins to allow recognition and destruction of, of viral DNA. And so for us as biochemists, we were fascinated by the question that relates to how this works. How does this happen? And so I started off studying, um, first of all, just sort of this RNA-guided process, how these RNA molecules were produced, and then ultimately focusing on how these RNA-guided proteins are able to search the cell, find a matching piece of DNA, and then what happens next. And so this, we call this part of the pathway uh, interference. And what I found was that, so we started working on this in the sort of the late um, 2000s, I think it was around 2006 or so that we started investigating this. And initially in my lab, most of the members of my lab were doing something else. They were working on other uh, RNA-related uh, systems in mammalian cells. We weren't actually working on bacteria for anything else in the lab. And, um, but over time, what happened was that the research was so interesting that the one or two people initially that were working on this in the lab, Blake Wiedenheft and, and Rachel Harwitz, two initial lab members studying this process, their work was so interesting that I found that members of my lab kept coming into my office and saying, can I work on CRISPR? <laughs> so that's how a project that started off as just a, you know, kind of a curiosity-driven uh, effort turned into something bigger initially. And eventually I went to a conference, and this was in 2011. I attended a meeting that I normally would have never attended by a, an organization called the American Society of Microbiology. So I'm not a microbiologist. Why did I get invited to this meeting? Well, uh, they had one session on CRISPR biology. And because there were you know, very few people working on this at the time, I, pre I guess I, I got invited maybe for that reason. And so there I was at, at, at this meeting, and I met another scientist named Emmanuel Charpentier, who was coming to CRISPR from a very different background from me. She's a microbiologist studying bacteria that infect people and trying to understand fundamental biology about these infectious bacteria for the purpose of ultimately developing good ways to fight them off. And so we, when we got together at this conference, we decided to go after a question that might sound obscure to you initially, it was this question here, what is the function of this protein known as Cas9? And the reason that we were interested in this is that Emmanuel's lab had evidence that this protein in the bacterium she was studying had the unique ability to use these CRISPR RNAs to find and somehow destroy uh, viral DNA by a molecular mechanism that was unknown at the time. And so we both wondered whether this, in fact, might be some kind of an RNA-guided cleaver. Uh, nobody had tested that, but we thought it would be an interesting question. And, and if it, in fact, was an RNA-guided cleaver, was this uh, sort of a, a little widget that you know bacteria of many different types were ultimately deploying in nature to defend themselves against viruses? So it's a, it was kind of a fun question. And, um, and so that started a wonderful international collaboration. Emmanuel was located at uh, the University of Umea in Sweden at the time. And so I came back to my group in, in, in uh, at Berkeley, and I invited a postdoc, Martin Jinek, who was just sort of in the last year of his training in my lab, 
uh, asked him whether he wanted to work on this project. And uh, the timing was perfect, and he was the right guy at the right time to work on this, on this story because he was a fabulous biochemist who was able to team up with a student at Chris Chylinski in Emmanuel's lab to do experiments that would have been very difficult for either lab to do on their own. And so what these guys figured out was that this Cas9 protein is uh, what we call a dual RNA-guided DNA cutting enzyme. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, I'm showing you here a cartoon of the Cas9 protein. So remember that that's being made in bacteria that have a CRISPR system. And it's literally a programmable protein. And what I mean by that is that it's got, a protein, it's got a program that is defined by this molecule of RNA called CRISPR RNA that has a 20-letter sequence derived from viruses, at least in bacteria, that can direct this protein to recognize a piece of DNA that comes from a virus because it has this matching sequence in the DNA. And importantly, this is a protein that requires a second type of RNA called tracer for assembly of this targeting complex. And when this thing searches the cell and finds a 20-letter sequence in DNA matching the CRISPR RNA, it's able to unwind the DNA double helix and allow Cas9 to make a, a break, a cut, in both strands of the double helix. You can think of DNA almost like a rope with, a, with two strands winding around each other. And this protein is like a cleaver that comes in and cuts the rope. And a mar remarkably, this isn't happening randomly in the cell. It's happening only at a place that matches this guide RNA. Now, when, um, when we did these experiments initially, so, so Martin Jinek in my lab, fabulous uh, biochemist, was doing what biochemists do. He was figuring out how this works by purifying these molecules and testing their activity under controlled laboratory conditions. And that led to the realization that we could actually simplify the system compared to what nature has done, where we have two separate molecules of RNA that provide the program for Cas9 by linking these RNAs together in what we called a single guide RNA format. So now we have a molecule that's got the program here, and it's got the handle for interaction with Cas9 over here. Now, this handle is the same in every RNA molecule, but we could trivially change this 20-letter sequence on the other end to direct Cas9 to a desired piece of DNA for cutting. And Martin did a great experiment where he literally designed five or six different single-guide RNAs that allowed us to cleave a piece of DNA at places that we predetermined by simply inserting the desired sequence right here in the RNA. And when Martin did that experiment, that was for us the aha moment when we looked at each other and said, holy smokes, this is a programmable protein. We know how to control it, and we can make it introduce a double-stranded break in DNA at a desired place. Now, why was this? You know, and, and the other thing I like to say is that th this is really the moment when, for us, this project went beyond this kind of little kind of curiosity-driven niche uh, question to implicating something much, much bigger. And to explain that, I have to um, show you what was going on across biology and a you know, many, many other labs over the previous two decades, which was namely to understand how DNA is repaired in cells and how cells like ours and plant cell, plant sort of plants and animal and human cells handle DNA double-stranded breaks. They do, they do something different from what bacteria do. Namely, they recognize that when a double-stranded break occurs in DNA, uh, instead of allowing this to lead to DNA destruction, this actually triggers DNA repair. And the repair can involve either a little disruption of the DNA sequence during the process of repair, but right at the position of that initial break, or it can lead to insertion of a new piece of DNA at the site of that initial break. And people had recognized that if you could introduce a break in a genome, in the DNA of a cell, at a desired position, you could trigger an edit to the DNA. You could trigger the cell to change the DNA sequence at, at just that position and nowhere else. 
And the challenge had been in, in sort of across the field at that time that was called genome engineering was how do we, how do we introduce double-stranded breaks into DNA so that this process can take over? And there were earlier technologies for doing this, fr frankly, going all the way back to, you know, in the 1980s when I was a graduate student, chemists were figuring out how to introduce double-stranded breaks that could allow mapping of genes in human cells and things like that. But those technologies were, you know, difficult enough to work with that most labs weren't able to adopt them. And the wonderful thing about CRISPR is that it's a simple enough system that scientists immediately grasped how powerful this could be and how, you know, this sort of simplified this challenge of making a targeted edit to the genome. And so you heard in Walter's wonderful introduction that, you know, there's been a progression of technologies that have happened over the last few decades that have brought on the sort of the modern era of molecular biology. And I think in many ways this technology of genome editing really is the, 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 was the missing piece. It provides scientists with the ability not only to read DNA and, and write DNA by, by synthesizing it, but also to rewrite DNA, to really edit the code of life for the first time. And that's why there's been tremendous excitement about this. Uh, I want to show you, uh, this is a video that just helps you to imagine how this actually works. So here we are zooming into a uh, a, a, a eukaryotic cell, a plant or animal cell, where the DNA is inside the nucleus, and we're seeing Cas9 molecules with their RNA program searching through the DNA looking for a matching sequence. And when this match occurs, this enzyme, this protein, is able to interact by unwinding the DNA. The RNA molecule is able to interact with one strand of the DNA inside the protein, and that triggers cleavage. So the DNA is cut, and then this protein, Cas9, is able to hand off the broken ends of the DNA to repair enzymes in the cell that fix this break by processes that include making a small change to the DNA as shown here, but also sometimes to actually inserting a new piece of genetic information at the site of the break. So very quickly after we published this work in the summer of 2012, labs around the world began to adopt this tool for engineering and editing the DNA of, in cells and organisms of all types. And what was amazing was that it seemed to work robustly in many systems. So it wasn't unique to bacteria or even to human cells, but to everything else, you know, plant cells, other kinds of um, single molecule, single uh, cell, celled organisms, but also uh, various other kinds of plants and animals. This is a chart that uh, I show just it's based on uh, uh, one of the um, academic journal uh, publishing houses that shows what happened in scientific publications with technologies for genome editing. So these are technologies for genome editing that preceded CRISPR. They're called meganucleases zinc finger nucleases and talons. So these were all different kinds of engineered proteins that could be engineered to recognize and cut DNA at a single site. And they, you know, had a, a, you know, a certain impact certainly in the scientific community showing people what was possible with genome editing. But when CRISPR came along, this just took off extremely rapidly, really essentially as an exponential curve of growth. And we now see thousands of papers in the scientific literature. So it really gives you a sense of the pace of science. I've certainly never experienced something like that in my scientific career where there was just this, you know, kind of explosion of science that became suddenly possible once you had a tool that was easy to use or easy enough to use for, for genome editing. And so what I want to do now is I really want to turn to some of the, both the opportunities and I think the important challenges that we face now that we have this powerful technology in hand to edit genomes. What are people doing with this? How is it going to affect any of us in, in the near future? And what do we do about some of the things that might, you know, concern us about using a, a, a tool like this? And I wanted to start off, so I want to, I want to really touch on four things. One is um, how CRISPR is affecting research, sort of fundamental uh, research that you know, many of us uh, and many folks here are, are doing. 
and also how it's, it's going to affect public health, agriculture, and biomedicine. And, and I would just start off by, by pointing out, and we had a, a great uh, conversation here earlier today that, um, that really uh, highlights the, the, the little vignette I'll tell you next, which is that one of the things that CRISPR has done for science is that it's made it possible to study organisms at a level that was never possible in the past. Namely, that you know, in the past, you, if you wanted to ask a question about the genetics of life and understand the genetics of a pathway, you typically had to work in what we call model organisms. There were a few, sort of a handful of these that had been developed very, very, very studiously and carefully over, you know, over many years in, in labs that allowed scientists to use genetic tools to manipulate DNA. But with CRISPR, it suddenly became possible to manipulate the DNA of, of essentially any uh, type of organism. And here's a great little story that illustrates the p potential of this. So, you know, one of the long-standing questions in biology has been why is it that organisms, and here we're sh I'm showing a snail, have handedness to their body type, right? And so this is, you know, showing you that, you know, in, in, in with, with snails, most snails in nature uh, look like this. In fact, the vast majority, where their, their shells actually curve around to the right. And, um, and the question was, you know, what, why? Why is that? What are the genetics of this? And, you know, could you actually make a, a snail with a left-handed shell? And this, you know, sounds like a, a crazy question, but it's actually very interesting because many organisms have handedness to their bodies and, and uh, we don't, we haven't really understood the genetics of that. Well, here was a, a case, this was actually just published uh, earlier in, in 2019, where a group was able to use the CRISPR technology to go in and manipulate the genetics of these snails to fit, find the gene that's actually responsible for that and create left-handed uh, snails, uh, these guys over here. And um, it's, you know, it's one of these just wonderful examples of a long-standing question that was waiting for the right tool, the right technology to come along so that it could actually be answered. And there's many really cool examples of this. Like there's a, uh, there's a, a wonderful woman that's working on the evolution of bipedalism. You know, why are, we, why are we able to walk on two legs? Well, she's doing it by studying and comparing rodents that are either quadrupeds, they use four legs, or they're bipedal, and by doing you know, genome editing to introduce genes from one into the other, trying to figure out, is there a simple program genetically that leads to bipedalism? You know, a question that you could have never imagined being able to answer even a few years ago. So what else is going on? Well, um, this is an example that hits very close to home. There's a fabulous uh, project that's going on with Ethan Beyer and his colleagues here at UC San Diego under to understand how CRISPR could be used for something called gene drives. And the, uh, the summary here is really just that, um, you know, if we look at how normal inheritance works, this shows you that, you know, if we have a population, let's say, of mosquitoes, they're passing along traits according to Mendelian genetics. This is kind of what this would look like. So uh, an altered gene doesn't spread very rapidly through a population because it's got to take this, this sort of um, generational progression. But imagine that you had a tool that allowed you to very rapidly introduce a genetic trait into organisms that didn't have that trait naturally in their genome. And that's really what CRISPR does. You can use it in a way that will allow this kind of lateral spread of genetic traits that we call a gene drive. And this means that ultimately the altered gene is almost always inherited. And, um, and it's sort of a kind of an interesting trick of, I suppose, of the technology, but it has a very interesting practical implication, which is that now it may be possible to control mosquito populations, for example, by engineering them so they either don't reproduce or that they can't pass along uh, a, um, a parasite that would otherwise be spread by mosquito bites so that this could have a potentially very dramatic impact on public health globally. So that's something that there's a lot of interest in investigating because of the you know, rapid spread of things like dengue virus and Zika, et cetera. In agriculture, again, you know, just really interesting opportunities. I love showing this slide. It's work by Zach Lipman, a scientist at Cold Spring Harbor Labs, who was able to use CRISPR to alter the, um, uh, the uh, genetics of tomatoes in a way that produces plants with um, fruit that's genetically identical to its parent species, except that it makes a lot more of these, a lot more tomatoes. 
And uh, I can tell you that from personal experience uh, with CRISPR tomatoes, which I just enjoyed with my family about two days ago, uh, these are fabulous. Uh, they're, 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 they're wonderful tasting uh, fruits, but you get about two or three times more per plant. And my son was asking me, well, why, why, would, that, why would that be important, Mom? And it's, you know, it's sort of, uh, made us uh, sort of discuss, well, what if you could produce the same amount of food from a much smaller number of plants? Imagine how that might impact water use, how, might, how it might impact the need for, um, for various kinds of either pesticides or nutrients that are required for these plants. It's, it's, it's something that I think could have a very big impact uh, globally in agriculture. And I personally think that genome editing, you know, at least in the near term, will have its biggest impact on human societies through agricultural applications. Now, this doesn't come without challenges. So this is, a, uh, this is an example of uh, some work that was done in an academic lab at Penn State University. So they were able to use CRISPR to knock out a single gene in mushrooms that prevents these mushrooms from turning brown when they're cut open. So maybe useful for you know, marketing purposes. Um, but it did raise the question of you know, how are products like this going to be regulated, or are they going to be regulated? And um, this sort of generated headlines a couple of years ago because in the United States, the Department of Agriculture decided that modified plants of that type with, you know, that had been uh, changed at genetically using CRISPR were not uh, going to be regulated. Why not? Well, because the way they did that, made that mushroom, was to disrupt a gene. They didn't introduce a new piece of foreign DNA into the mushroom. They simply disrupted a natural gene that was there. And so the, uh, in the US, that uh, plant product would not be considered genetically modified and would not be regulated. Now, that's not true everywhere. So in Europe, there's a, you know active uh, debate about this. But, but um, uh, a recent ruling suggested that um, you know, there would be a, a concern about this in Europe and that plant products of that type would, in fact, have to be regulated and, in fact, might not even be marketable. So this has been a very active area of discussion, lots of companies, of course, thinking about this because it affects international trade and how agricultural products might be uh, purchased and, and sold abroad. And guaranteed, this will you know, continue to be uh, very actively debated because people are grappling with you know, what does it mean to have a tool that allows rapid manipulation and targeted manipulation of, uh, of the genetics of plants. And then finally, before I get into sort of biomedical applications, I wanted to mention that um, there are increasingly, uh, we're finding opportunities to use CRISPR-Cas systems and proteins in ways that might not have been anticipated initially. So this was uh, uh, some, this is sort of a summary slide that is based on research that two graduate students in our lab, Alexandra Isileski and then Janice Chen, did initially, showing that in some CRISPR-Cas enzymes that are related to Cas9, but, but come from different kinds of bacteria, they actually have a remarkable ability to recognize a piece of DNA using the RNA guides, that's what this cartoon shows, but in addition to cutting that target strand of DNA, the cutter, the cutting domain in the protein, remains active and can cut pieces of DNA that are provided to it in, uh, in sort of in what we call in trans as a separate uh, piece of DNA. And, and what Janice Chen figured out was that you could actually make little pieces of DNA chemically that have fluorescent dyes associated with them. And when those pieces of DNA are cleaved, they release a fluorescent signal that you can detect in the lab. Now, why would you want to do that? Well, it turns this CRISPR-Cas protein into a sensor that when it detects a sequence matching the guide RNA, it turns on the cleaver and you get a fluorescent signal. So we're now using this as a way to detect DNA molecules in settings where you don't have access to fancy technology. And we've found so far that you can do very rapid and very uh, sensitive detection of DNA using uh, both, actually both DNA and RNA, it turns out, using these uh, types of proteins. So this is a potentially an interesting strategy in the future for diagnostics. So I finally, I wanted, I wanted to turn to um, what's happening uh, in biomedical science by pointing out that when we talk about genome editing, um, it's important to understand that the, that the way that cells are edited occurs in two different 
types or two different flavors. One we call somatic cell editing, and that means making changes to DNA that ultimately affect fully differentiated or fully developed organs or organisms and are not inherited by future generations. And that's different from making changes in germ cells, in the germ line, like you know, sperm or eggs or embryos, where those genetic changes are uh, inherited by, by future generations. And, um, and so you can just, if you start to think about it, you can imagine that you know, there are very different issues that come along with uh, these two different types of editing. If we're doing somatic cell editing, and especially if we were doing this to, let's say, uh, cure someone of a genetic disease, if this were done in an individual, I would argue that that technology is essentially not really distinct from, in, at least in terms of its uh, uh, safety and, and effectiveness, not really different from other kinds of therapies that you might use. You'd want to be sure it worked, and you'd want to be sure it was safe, but it's affecting that one individual. But this is very different, right? This is making a change that becomes permanent in that person and their children and grandchildren, et cetera. So it's passed on to many generations. Um, and so, but I'll come back to that. But I want to first um, illustrate an example of somatic cell editing. And I have to tell you that this is an area where I think there's tremendous opportunity. The field is moving really fast. We already have clinical trials that are underway for, um, at least for, I think right now, for uh, focusing on cancer and eye diseases, but in the near future for uh, some other diseases, including sickle cell disease. Now, this is a disease of the blood. It involves a single letter change, a single base pair in DNA that is mutated in patients that have uh, sickle cell disease. And if they inherit two copies, of this uh, hemoglobin gene that have the sickle uh, mutation, then they produce hemoglobin that is prone to aggregation and their blood cells become sickled. And this is a cartoon that illustrates what happens in that case, which is that typically they have uh, blood vessels that get clogged with these cells and they undergo these horrible sort of sickle uh, crises that, that happen sort of successively. And right now, medicine doesn't have any way to cure these folks or even really to treat them except to give them blood transfusions and you know, sort of given sort of palliative care. But it's, uh, it's, a, very, um, you know, it's a very unpleasant disease. And uh, I wanted to show you a clip from a forthcoming uh, documentary called Human Nature that takes a look at, just to give you a flavor for what it's going to be like when we can actually cure a disease like this. You know? And we're on the horizon of this. And this uh, clip just starts off with, uh, showing you a, uh, a boy called David, his name is David, who is a, a sickle cell, uh, suffers from sickle cell disease, and he goes to Stanford University, and he works with a scientist there, Matt Porteous, to observe how CRISPR could work to correct the disease-causing mutation in his own blood cells. So take a look at this. So now we're mixing the cells with the CRISPR. It's really cool. Once it's into the cell, that starts the editing process. We can't see that. We just know it happens. I don't know how out of all the genes that you have that it targets the one that's doing sickle cell and not the thing that's making you grow hair. Oh. But it does, apparently. I guess that's cool. <laughs> And I just think that is so awesome. And when, you, you know, when I watched this film for the first time and saw that clip, it's so moving because you know, this boy, and the, you know, if you watch this movie, it starts off, and it's a documentary, it starts off with him in the hospital with his grandmother, and he's going through a sickle crisis, and you know, he, he's suffering. But other than that, he's, just a, he's a very normal teenager. You know, he's playing basketball, and he's got his iPhone, and, you know, he's, and, and, uh, and it just it gives you a sense that in the future, we will be able to offer people like David a cure for this disease that otherwise he would be suffering from for his, his entire life. Now, um, that, that, would, that would involve somatic cell editing. Okay, So this would involve making changes to the cells in one individual's uh, blood, blood supply, blood system, but not changes that could be inherited. But heritable germline uh, genome editing is different. That means making changes in eggs or sperm or embryos. This is an example of a, a mouse uh, embryo that's being 
uh, held over here by a pipette, and you can see uh, on the other side a, a needle coming in and injecting uh, CRISPR-Cas9 with its guide RNA. So this started to be done very early on, just in the, in the first few months uh, after we had published this work in 2012. Rudolf Janisch and then many others started to do this in animal cells, in fact, in you know, sort of mice and rats or animals that are used a lot in scientific research. They've also, it's also been done in pigs, as I showed the last, on the last slide, and uh, many other now kinds of organisms. So it was clear to many of us from those early moments that, of this technology that, that there wasn't, didn't seem to be any scientific reason why it couldn't also be done in human embryos. And what would that mean? And what would be the implications of this? So in early 2015, I convened a meeting of scientists uh, up in Northern California. We invited people from around the country who had been involved in different capacities with thinking about either new or you know, budding uh, technologies in, in molecular biology or were actively using uh, the CRISPR-Cas9 technology. And we ended up writing a perspective that was published in a scientific journal, Science Magazine, that, um, that really called for what we, we, we termed a, a prudent path forward. And this, the, the purpose of this was really to highlight to not only uh, scientists, but we hoped people uh, who were beyond our, our field of science about the, the potential, but also the, the risk of this technology, especially if it were applied in human embryos to create uh, babies who would then have uh, genome edits, edits that they could transmit to future generations. And, um, and this led to uh, various kinds of international meetings, including eventually a report that was published in early 2017 by the National Academies of Science on this. And essentially, all of these reports early on called for, uh, whether they termed it a moratorium or uh, or something else, they were really all calling for a restraint uh, on the scientific community from using this to create gene-edited uh, babies. But then uh, at the end of uh, 2018, the event that you know, many of us sort of could foresee coming at some point uh, actually happened, and that was that a scientist announced at a conference in Hong Kong that he had, in fact, uh, created uh, babies had, had uh, created uh, human embryos that had gene edits that were then implanted to create a pregnancy. And there was the birth of twin girls who had alterations to their genome created using CRISPR. Now, this uh, set off kind of an international uh, outcry, I would say. Uh, I was at this uh, meeting when, when Ho Jung Kui, shown here, was presenting this work. And, um, and I think many of us felt that this was just wrong on, on many levels. It was wrong because the science and technology wasn't ready for this kind of application. But more importantly, it was wrong because there hadn't been an opportunity to really uh, deeply consider whether this would be a wise use of the technology and how would uh, people who had been treated in this way, like, such as these, uh, these girls, how would their health be monitored? How would we be, be able to ensure that they wouldn't have a negative health outcome? And one of the things that was most uh, shocking to me was actually that, um, that when, when uh, this was actually the work of Sean Ryder, a professor at the University of Massachusetts, he actually took the data that Ho Jung Kui had presented at the conference, which, by the way, has still not been published in a peer-reviewed uh, place, um, and looked in detail at the uh, genetic manipulations that were introduced. What was clear was that the changes that were introduced were not those that were actually um, um, intended, and they had never, in fact, been tested in humans. So just to understand this, I, you don't have to look at the details at all here, but you just need to notice that these two bars at the top don't look like these three on the bottom. So the top is a, a cartoon of a gene called CCR5 that is, encodes a protein necessary for HIV virus to infect uh, a person's immune cells. And the purpose, the stated purpose of this uh, work was to disrupt that gene by creating a 32 base pair deletion of DNA in that CCR5 gene to disrupt the uh, encoded protein and prevent HIV from being able to infect uh, people that would have this, uh, this uh, disruption in their, in their DNA. 
and in fact, there are natural uh, people uh, in the natural human population that, that have this kind of disruption. And that was one of the tip-offs that CCR5 is an important receptor for HIV viral infection. Well, unfortunately, when the CRISPR technology was used in these, uh, in these uh, embryos that were implanted, it appears that the changes, the genetic changes that were made, yes, they uh, occurred in the CCR5 gene, but if you look at the details, the details are different from this here. So all three of these changes that were found in the, uh, these twin girls that were born are different from any change that, uh, to anyone's knowledge, have ever been uh, naturally occurring in the human population. And they've never even been tested in animals. So, you know, it's really was sort of chilling to me to see this presented as though it was something desirable to be done. Now, um, with that being said, you know, wh where do we go from here? You know, are our CRISPR babies sort of right around the corner? And, you know, and, and you, we continue to see uh, stories in the media about this. There's, there's no doubt that there's a lot of interest in this, both from uh, storytellers and people in Hollywood, uh, but also from scientists. You know, and I, you, you, know, you might or might not be surprised to know that I've had calls from people uh, in the US, very reputable people who are interested in this technology. They want to know how soon it will be possible to do this. Um, how can they get involved in working on this? Um, and uh, you know, it's, it's clearly something that intrigues uh, many people. So you know, are, are, are these sorts of uh, traits uh, right around the corner? Well, you might or might not be relieved to know that um, these are all the types of traits that typically involve many genes, not just one. And in most cases, we don't know the collection of genes that lead to these phenotypes. So like it or not, we're probably not going to be able to you know, deal with this uh, genetically anytime soon. And, and, uh, and I think that our knowledge of the human genome, at least today, really holds back the editing of, of human embryos for, a, for clinical use. But that will change over time. So I think it's critical that we grapple with this um, very interesting but very challenging uh, question and, and, and application of gene editing right now. So what's happening? Well, you know, the World Health Organization has, a, has convened an international committee to, to review this. And uh, that's also uh, going on in a committee that's convened by the National Academies of Science. Their reports will be coming out in the coming months. And in the meantime, you know, many of us are, um, you know, in the scientific and clinical communities are actively debating and discussing this. At the Innovative Genomics Institute that I run up in the Bay Area, we have a whole, sort of an ongoing uh, public lecture series where we invite people to come and learn about the technology and discuss and debate uh, this, this, this topic as well as other applications of CRISPR. And I think that's, that's really going to be key to ensuring responsible use going forward. So, I just want to co close by pointing out that you know the, what I showed you, sort of this RNA-guided mechanism of gene editing, but I would call it really gene regulation. I didn't have time to show you, but there's sort of many ways to manipulate the CRISPR tools so that you can control the levels of proteins that are made from genes. This is a really powerful technology. It's a whole toolbox that scientists now have for controlling genetics in essentially any type of organism. It's going to be essential to figure out how to deliver these molecules into cells and tissues, certainly for clinical use, and also to control the way that genome editing happens, as you saw in that example with the CCR5 gene. And finally, fundamental research continues. So scientists globally are continuing to find new examples of these systems, to engineer them to do things they don't do in nature. And, and I, I really feel like we're, you know, we're really sort of right, living right in the midst of this transformative technology that is going to change our world, and it will change it in the very near future. So I want to thank a great team. So this is a, a group, uh, uh, some of my lab members up at Berkeley. And we've had many great collaborators over the years. Uh, I'm just showing a few of them here. I particularly want to shout out uh, Emmanuel Charpentier, with whom we started this work on CRISPR-Cas9. And she's now located at the Max Planck Institute in Berlin. And then you know, as, science, as academic scientists, we rely on public and private funding for the work that we do. And I, I really want to thank all of our funding sources, and in particular, the Howard Hughes Medical Institute and the National Science Foundation, they both gave my lab uh, money to work on CRISPR biology back at a time when, you know, none of us had any idea where it was going. And so I'm really grateful for that. <laughs>
And finally, I'll just mention the Innovative Genomics Institute, where uh, we're, you can find us on the web. And um, we're really an organization. We're academic. We're nonprofit. We're interested in advancing genome research, but doing it with uh, sort of social responsibility in different ways. So check us out on the web. And if you come to the Bay Area, uh, I'd be delighted to, to hook you up with a, uh, with a tour. Thank you very much. It's a great question. He's asking about the patent situation. So if you haven't, if you aren't aware of it, you know, CRISPR babies are one topic the media loves to, to, to uh, write about, and the patent fight over CRISPR is the other. So um, you know, this is a, it's a very interesting situation, I would say, because the question fundamentally is, what happens when there's a technology that is broadly enabling, it works in many different, you know, sort of across different kinds of systems, and um, there are commercial opportunities. The purpose of patents, of course, is to provide protection for companies and investors that might want to put money into a technology or an application of that technology, knowing that and, and be able to trust that they'll reap profit from that in the future because they've got some protection around an invention. And it's a challenge when you have this kind of a, you know, broadly enabling technology. Right now, there's a, so there's been an ongoing patent dispute between two academic organizations, primarily between uh, MIT and the Broad Institute on the one hand, and the University of California on the other hand. And uh, today, you know, the status of that is that, you know, uh, lawyers are making a lot of money. Um, um, that'll probably continue uh, in the foreseeable future. What I think is really important to point out, though, is that that patent situation has not held back the science. So the science continues to advance very, very quickly. And one of the reasons for that is that any of us that are working in academic labs are not, you know, we're not held back by uh, patents. We can do the science that we want to do without worrying about uh, who, you know, licensing, taking a license to intellectual property. And, um, and it frankly also not, has not held back investors and companies. There are now three companies that are publicly traded, soon to be more, that are focused on CRISPR applications, and many, many, many privately held uh, startups that are using CRISPR. Why is that? Well, because I think everybody figures that by the time you know, there are actual products and applications that come online, either the patent situation will have been sorted out or uh, will have run out of years of protection anyway. So um, <laughs> whichever comes first. So um, you know, anyway, as a scientist, I feel grateful that we're able to continue to advance the work despite this uh, ongoing patent dispute. <laughs>